So this week's 80-20 lifestyle topic, we're going to explore movement. And let me start with a quote by a guy called Frank Booth, who's one of the world's leading exercise physiologists. And he said, the human genome has not changed in over 45,000 years. The current genome requires and expects us to be highly physically active for normal functioning. What we now know is our genome is wired for this hunter-gatherer lifestyle and it hasn't adapted to the fact that we don't move very much anymore. The average Australian office worker takes between three and 5,000 steps a day. When you compare that to the Amish community who live a very traditional lifestyle, they take around 18 to 20,000 steps a day and hunter-gatherers take 18 to 25,000 steps a day. But when we don't move, we now understand what happens to our biology, basically to the, your ecosystem, and how there are widespread changes in gene expression that really make your ecosystem not function very well and cause all sorts of chronic diseases over time. These things don't happen over a year, but over 10, 20, 30 years, it's basically about that system gone wrong. And we now know that chronic sitting is actually um, been recognized as an independent risk factor for chronic disease. And in fact, studies compared those who sit for 11 hours a day or more have an increased risk of chronic disease by increased by about 40% versus those who sit for five hours or less. And the reason is that when you sit, particularly for long periods of time, 30 minutes, half an hour, there are massive changes in gene expression which affect biological systems that are going on inside the body, increases your blood pressure, reduces your, your insulin sensitivity, all these things that predispose you to chronic disease over time. So the key thing is if you are in an office job, is how do you build in that movement throughout the day? Having little prompts where every 30 minutes you stand up, a sit to st uh, stand workstation is fantastic, but if you don't have one of those, and um, things like every time you're on the phone, you stand up or you walk, you can have walking meetings. There's a number of little strategies you can build in so that you combat this damage that happens with chronic sitting. And this paper explored the impact that it has on the brain uh, and brain function and how it's being destroyed um, because the changes in gene expression affect our ener energy metabolism, which ultimately has a negative impact on our brain. So let's explore what I call the physical activity triad and in the view of that fact that our genome hasn't changed for 45,000 years. And I think um, personally getting some sort of activity tracker, I've got a Fitbit but you can have a Jawbone, a Garmin, any of these things is actually one of the best investments you'll ever make in your health because it gives you a good idea snapshot of your overall level of movement. So we've got to take into account our workplace physical activity. And um, we know that that has reduced by about the equivalent of 100 calories a day um, over the last 20 years. Now that doesn't seem very much, but over the period of a working year, that can be two to three kilos of fat. Um, incidental activity, that's what you're doing when you're not at work or you're not doing exercise or sport. And now we do a lot more screen time. We sit a lot more than we used to do 10, 20, 30 years ago. And then dedicated activity, actually we do as much of this as possible, uh, sorry, as we've ever done. But if you're an office worker and you like to sit on your bum to relax, you need to do a lot more of that and or introduce more movement into all three aspects of your life. And I, I'm a big fan of that. And, and just a personal story, when I first got a Fitbit, um, my key thing, I knew 70,000 steps a week is the minimum. So averaging out about 10,000 steps a day, and that's what I was doing. And as I got more and more friends on Fitbit, and um, that whole gamification thing started. And now I, I, my new baseline is over 100,000 steps a week. Um, but last year, I, I got um, a, a, a new EA who worked for me. She got a Fitbit and then asked for one for her husband. So we got him a Fitbit. And he joined my leaderboard. And here he is right at the top of my leaderboard. He popped in at uh, just around 200,000 steps a week. Now, is the guy a marathon runner? No, he's not. He's a chef. And he runs um, three different cafes, so the guy is on his feet all day long. Now, that gives him massive disease protection against someone who would be getting those 70,000 steps. So he actually needs to do less of the dedicated activity than people who are actually have an office job or are reasonably sedentary. 
So talking about that dedicated exercise, um, when we have a look at exercise, it is very beneficial in preventing and treating the symptoms of a whole host of diseases. And here you can see that cardiovascular, traditional cardio training and strength training actually have complementary benefits. So there's a bit of a crossover, but there are some conditions where only one of them will actually work. So lots of them are physical and we probably have known about these sorts of things for years. Um, one interesting one that, that's come to light recently and is very relevant for Australia with our high levels of, of stress, distress and depression is the impact of exercise on, on depression. And in virtually every um, clinical control trial that's ever been done that compares exercise versus antidepressant medication as a treatment for depression, exercise wins hands down. And the reason is that when you exercise, very important neurotransmitters are, are released and balanced out in the brain. Things such as um, dopamine and serotonin, which are involved in mood and motivation, but also um, neurotransmitters that balance your brain like GABA and glutamate. And there's also feed good chemicals uh, like endorphins and endocannabinoids that are all released whenever we exercise. And it has a huge impact on our mental health as well as our overall cognitive function. So the other thing that we know about exercise is that it is a very, very powerful driver of gene expression. And in doing this, it actually staves off the aging effect. And we've seen this through lots of long-term studies, and we now know the science by which that happens. So if we explore some of the changes in gene expression, um, here we can look at the, the response um, to your genes when you exercise. When you're actually doing exercise, um, particularly over prolonged periods or intense, you get what's called stress response genes, things like heat shock proteins, which are actually released and, and can actually then protect your cells against further damage. Damage. These are, are the, 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 I guess, the metabolic equivalent of, of, um, of your special forces that are protecting your cells. Um, but we also then have these what we call metabolic priority genes, um, which are really important in, in how you metabolize energy and stuff like that and make your system run more efficiently. And then over the longer periods of time, you have these um, mitochondrial or metabolic genes that are released and can actually improve how your cells function. And the gene expression of these can last for a week after exercise. So when we do regular exercise, we get almost permanent increases in these protective genes that actually make our system run better and have lots of anti-aging and other effects. So if we explore um, this stuff a little bit deeper, um, here are some of the things, just some of the things that happen when you do exercise, particularly regular exercise. So we talked about our mitochondria, and, and we will get mitochondrial biogenesis. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you think about most of your cells, other than red blood cells and a couple of others, have these things called mitochondria, which is basically like the powerhouse or the turbine of the cell. It creates all the energy and it keeps the cell healthy uh, and it breaks down fats and, and gives you, uh, get to convert it into energy for the cell. And when we exercise, we actually get new mitochondria. This is the biogenesis creation of new. And actually, when we do a form of exercise called high-intensity interval training, not only do we get more of these new mitochondria, but it can actually repair the damaged mitochondria that we have. And now we're finding lots of chronic diseases are actually because of damaged mitochondria. Heat shock proteins, these HSPs, I talked about those earlier, so they protect your cells against further damage. IGF-1, this has a huge impact on learning and memory. And actually, it works with, with other growth factors in the brain um, to bring all the benefits of exercise to the brain. So when you exercise, and particularly in the morning, even a short bout of vigorous activity actually primes your brain for high function all day long. And especially if you can do little repeated bouts throughout the day, um, that is really going to get your brain functioning very, very well for the whole day. These two growth factors, FGF and VEGF, what they do is they help grow your vascular network. So all the little blood vessels that bring all the oxygen and blood and nutrients to all of the cells in your body. And that's improved with exercise because we get those growth factors that actually creates um, this whole infrastructure for delivering this blood, this oxygen and nutrients. 
But the superstar of the show right now, especially in terms of neuroscience, is this stuff BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. Now, neurotropic stands for nerve growth. So what we now know is that when you exercise, this stuff is released. And it's released in proportion to exercise intensity. So doing the higher intensity exercise releases more BDNF. Now, BDNF actually helps you to grow new brain cells. Up until 1997, we did not think this was possible. We now know that you can grow new brain cells any time in your life. But this stuff is pretty critical for it. Now, not only does BDNF help you grow new brain cells, but it helps the connections between those brain cells and it protects your brain cells against damage from traumatic brain injury or stroke or any of those things. If you have higher BDNF, you will suffer less damage because of these um, conditions. And the other thing that we're now seeing is that in lots of chronic diseases, there is low levels of BDNF. Um, so BDNF is a real target for pharmaceutical companies because it has such beneficial effects, not only in the brain, uh, but throughout the rest of the body. Uh, and there is a, a, it is free um, um, with this exercise, particularly when we do regular, more vigorous type exercise. That's when we'll get this BDNF and these growth factors. So the take home message when you're exercising for me is to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because when your brain is telling you that this is uncomfortable and we should just stop this rubbish right now, that's when you need to tell your brain to suck it up, princess. Because that is when all the good stuff is happening. It is the stress of exercise that drives the body to, to adapt. And it adapts by changing gene expressions that makes us bigger, faster, stronger, and protects our body against disease and aging. Now, in terms of exercise, what, what we've been finding out recently and more and more studies coming out that's showing that that excessive endurance exercise what we call cardio can actually damage the heart over many many years now and before you get alarmed and um, this is the the emerging research is showing that it is guys who do marathons and ultra marathons and do it for years that they can actually damage their heart over time and um, so that may not be the best form of exercise doing that steady state where we keep our heart rate it's high and we go for a long, long run, it can cause damage. And we're seeing post-marathons and post-triathlons, there's actually markers of, of heart damage um, that is released after this. So too much exercise can be um, not, not ideal for us as well. Which brings me into the form of exercise that's got a lot of attention recently, which is high intensity interval training. And it's got attention for good reason because it's been shown to be superior to traditional cardiovascular training in terms of the return on your investment. So you can do a much shorter session of high intensity interval stuff and get all the benefits of cardio and in fact some other benefits in a fraction of the time of doing your, your chronic cardio. Um, so... For instance, if you take this guy, um, so a form of head training, people think it's this really super high intensity. If I was um, coaching this guy, I'd be saying, look, look, mate, lampposts are our key thing. What I want you to do for the next two weeks is just you're going to go out for a walk, 15, 20 minutes a night. Between the first two lampposts, I want you to walk fast, as fast as you can. And then I want you to walk slow between the next two, then fast, then slow. So when he's walking fast, he's going to be uncomfortable. That for him is high intensity stuff. And then he'll recover. So that's the interval bit. Now, that's only going to work for a, a while. He's going to get fitter. He's going to adapt to that. And then when he comes back, I'll say, okay, now what I want you to do is jog between the first two lampposts, then walk, then jog, then walk. As he gets fitter again, he has to up the intensity again. He's got to go half pace, then eventually three quarter pace. And eventually when he gets super fit, it'll be sprint, walk, sprint, walk walk, sprint, walk. These are all forms of high intensity interval where you go hard for a particular period of time, whether it's 20, 30 seconds, and most HIT protocols will be less than a minute um, of all out or near maximal activity. And then you recover for a while and then you go again and you do a number of cycles. So to help you with this, um, uh, we've actually put together a number of pre-made workouts that are all body weight, that don't require any equipment, very little space, um, and they combine both strength and cardiovascular training and 
flexibility or mobility. So if you click on, on the app, these are only on the app, not on the website, you've got to click the more tab in the bottom right. When you click to there and you scroll down, you'll see workouts. You click on workouts and you'll see we've got five different levels of workouts. Um, level one is, is pretty pretty basic, but it's good functional movement. There is, there is more rest between the exercise components and there's less of the exercise. So we're going to build that base. And as you get fitter, you work your way up from, from level one. Level five is where we go pretty hard. Um, so on any of these uh, workouts, if you, you come to this screen, you can um, add your music tracks. You just click on here. You can add your music to your phone from your phone. You can preview the exercises. So you click on here and it's going to bring up um, the videos of all the exercises that are involved. You just click on that video and you can see um, how that exercise actually plays. Then whenever you're ready for it, you just click on next. Uh, when you clicked on next, it's going to bring you to the workout thing and um, you just press start. It'll play your music. It'll give you a countdown and then um, it'll give you your work phase and the video will play. So you'll be working for a set amount of time and then you'll be recovering. And when you're recovering, um, it'll give you, again, it'll give you a countdown, but it'll also show you the next video. So all you got to do is stick this, stick your phone or your iPad in the corner of the room and press play and off you go. So just to summarize this, um, a minimum of 70,000 steps a week is really what you're after, but age specific. If, if you are less than 50 or 60, I would be saying get those 70,000 steps a week. As you get older, maybe you can trim some of that off, right? Um, and additionally, in top of that, two to five exercise sessions a week, depending on, on how fit you want to get and how much of a peak performer you want to be. And those exercise sessions should be a combination of high intensity interval training of which there's, there's lots of formats. Resistance or strength training uh, is very important, particularly as we get older. It is more important to do resistance or strength training as we get older because it, it preserves those fast twitch fibers. It, it, Fat muscle fibers that, that we use with, to stop us falling over. It also pre uh, preserves muscle, which helps protect us against lots of diseases and helps with our hormone profile. And the other form that you can do is circuits or body weight training. And we've provided you um, with lots of resources around particularly that body weight training. And there's other um, videos on there about different forms of HIIT training. So, excuse me, that is, that is your takeout. Minimum 70k steps a week and then with a bit of competition you'll find that number will go up and up and then don't forget your dedicated exercise.